government has the capacity to track virtually every American phone call. Five billion cell phone location records a day. Prism program sweeping up vast amounts of internet everything. Emails, photos, chat. If you haven't heard, our government is spying on us. And it seems to have become addicted to our data. The National Security Agency is quietly building the largest spy center in the country. But it wasn't always this way. Spying in the American Revolution was mostly the shoe leather kind. In the Civil War, recon tactics included photography and even the use of hot air balloons. Generally, though, U.S. espionage was ad hoc and uncoordinated until an information revolution. Suddenly, we could file and tabulate, organize and automate, record and retrieve huge amounts of information. All this was put to use in the Philippines, which we had just colonized. Rebellion rocked the islands. To crush it, our military had an idea. Build a full-scale surveillance state. Thousands of Filipinos were indexed with the help of new technology. Where they went, who they knew, their political and religious views, their vices and fears, everything was secretly logged and filed. Those found supporting independence were punished. Many were executed. Information was power. At the time, Mark Twain wrote that what we did abroad would come back to haunt us. Years later, America entered World War I. New laws were passed to silence dissenters, but the real targets became those the public called the Reds. Immigrants, leftists, and labor unions. To catch these enemy aliens, post offices censored mail, banning radical and ethnic newspapers. Labor strikes surged after the war, and so did fear of the Reds. Using the Philippines as a guide, the Justice Department filed every radical leader, organization, and publication into a secret index. Over 200,000 cards were logged. By 1920, thousands of people had been arrested, many without a warrant. Most were U.S. citizens. The hysteria died, but the template for domestic spying had been set. Since then, history has repeated itself. First, there's a real or exaggerated crisis. The Soviet Union, the number one menace. Then, in the name of national security, the government begins spying operations at home. And I think this march will the eavesdropping gradually goes mainstream. Many Americans were tapped and bugged, had their mail opened by the CIA and the FBI. Until things are finally exposed. Many of the techniques were clearly illegal. Crisis. Spying in the name of national security. This new law that I signed today will allow surveillance of all communications used by terrorists. Targeting minority groups. The FBI has employed a fleet of small aircraft carrying video and cell phone surveillance technology in dozens of cities. But today, the game has changed. See, private companies have long played a role in government surveillance. The Hobart missile received instructions from the IBM computer. But this public-private partnership has gotten a lot cozier. Amazon now stores data for the entire intelligence community. Google has boosted search capabilities for the NSA and CIA. One company that makes cell phone spying technology forbids police from talking about how they use it, even in court. And consider this. Telegraph companies of yesteryear made their money by providing a service. Communication. Today, the companies we use to communicate with profit by learning as much as they can about us. So, if history's taught us that information is power, 
who do we really want to wield it? 